Welcome everybody uh, to today's lecture. We are a week behind. So today we should have read um, and, and still reading this week uh, two classics. One uh, is the classic of British anthropology and called the book is called Witchcraft, Oracle and Magic among the Azande. The book by Evans Pritchard, and we're particularly interested in the second chapter of the book. The witchcraft, the notion of witchcraft, explains unfortunate events. And we're also reading the classic of American anthropology, Mary Douglas's book, Purity and Danger. And we're particularly interested in the third chapter of the book on the abominations of Leviticus. Um, so you, I hope you uh, have watched the documentary about Evans Pritchard adventures in the South Sudan and in Africa in general. And I thought it was very sort of, uh, it was a good documentary explaining to us today how anthropology was done back in the day by, you know, uh, classics, the white bearded man who went somewhere to Africa to study like exotic people like Azanda or Nuer. And um, uh, Evans Pritchard, uh, he, he, like in this sense, I guess he's a representative of the traditional British anthropology in the sense that he's a white man from um, um, a British university who he was not only, you know, he was also a colonial official because he worked for the um, Anglo-Egyptian administration of Sudan, which is of course a colonial administration of Sudan. So he was also what we would call a colonial chinovnik, right? So he's also like those Russian uh, officials who would study Kazakhs, but uh, it is also clear that uh, the study he produced, he, he did not produce them on the way. He did not, he like had this purpose of going and living with Azanda and trying to understand and translate to us the, the system and translate to us their religion, yeah? And that's what he was very good at, at translating and also finding patterns. Um, Hello. You can uh, okay. Let's let me suggest for everybody to turn uh, mics down, and if you have questions, you can type questions now. And in the end, I will leave ten minutes for Q and A. Okay, or even more time for Q and A. Hopefully, if I pace myself well. So what was I talking about? So Evans Pritchard um, is a representative of that colonial anthropology, but uh, I would say that he was a good one <laughs> in the sense that he took it seriously and he spent a, a, a very long time with the natives to the point of even going native and he, uh, would be one of those anthropologists who would say that, you know, I almost went native, he said, when he was asked, so do you believe in witchcraft? And he said, you know, like, yes, when I was with Azanda and there was this light traveling, yeah, I, I saw the light traveling. So I guess I believed in the witchcraft by uh, living with them. Uh, remember when we were talking about nostalgia, I was, um, uh, I told you about the concept of this uh, cyclical time. That cyclical time, which is a daily cycle, a seasonal cycle, and even cycles of life, and even generational. That is what what we have gone through. I don't know we are born, then we get I don't know, go to the kindergarten, to the school, get married, da da da, get retired. The same kind of happens with other people, right? And with uh, other generations. Uh, so, and this is the concept of the structural time that um, Evans Pritchard came up with by studying another P 
people of Africa called Nuer, and he was um, observing their seasonal migration. They're also kind of nomads, but they migrate like vertical migration. They migrate like during the rainy season, they migrate, uh, you know, upwards to the hills and during the drought, they come down. So they combine agriculture with uh, um, cow herding. Um, so that's one of the important um, contributions to our understanding of time, the concept of what he calls structural time and what we today understand as cycličné vremya uh, agrarnova obshistva. Um, and, and it's structural time, but it's also it connects societies, like for instance, people remember not the objective date, but they remember the social event, for instance, they, oh, that was the year that such and such as wedding was, oh, that was the year that such and such thing happened. So they remember through events that tied together the community. So now um, coming back to the topic of the day, the witchcraft, as you can understand, uh, or as you might understand, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was lots of prejudice, uh, particularly on the part of the European public against the people who uh, professed, let's so-called primitive religions, right? Because uh, Aboriginals would say something, oh, don't go to this mountain, you will be cursed, or oh, don't do this, you will be, you know, and people assume that this is something irrational, this is primitive, this does not make any sense. So people like Mary Douglas and people like Evans Preacher, they kind of said to explain to um, the European public and to the whole world how it actually makes sense and how this religion or the system of beliefs, if we don't call it a religion, witchcraft, actually makes sense for Azanda and how it organizes their society and, and how the witchcraft functions as something that makes sense in the society. And that's what we are going to talk today. We are, we are going to try to understand how witchcraft, uh, actually can make sense in societies. So Azanda, there's a tribe in South Sudan, the Central African Republic, Northern. So remember how in the documentary, in order to get to Sudan, like in the 20s, in the second half of the 20s, of the, uh, I think he traveled in the 1927 from Britain. So he had to get to, first to Egypt, right? To then by uh, sea, right? So he would travel to, I imagine, to the port of Alexandria. Then he would go to Cairo. From Cairo, he would get to, on the railroad to get uh, to Khartoum in Sudan. And from there, he would go up the Nile, you know, to the um, upward, upstream along the Nile further. And the whole uh, travel to Azanda at the time took seven weeks. Uh, and as I said, he spent with them 20 months and he almost so-called went native. So what is a witchcraft? Witchcraft is a natural philosophy about the relationship between men and unfortunate events. It's ubiquitous in the sense that it's uh, it's kind of, it's not like a magic. It's not like, uh, although of course there is a, maybe some parts of or that, that are connected with magic, but it's, it's kind of that happens at almost everyday occurrence, but it's also um, something that people um, look forward even, right? In the sense that uh, they expect this to happen, that they expect that throughout their lives, they might be bewitched, right? And some bad things and unfortunate occurrences can happen to them because of this of being bewitched. There is nothing, so it's not a miracle, right? That's something, it's, it's kind of an everyday, it's kind of that happens. So there is no fear, rather anger and annoyance about it, that, you know, why somebody would do this to me when I'm, you know, such a good person and I'm going around minding my own business. And one of the first things that uh, people of, I guess, European upbringing would think uh, when they hear 
of the witchcraft that you know somebody was walking in the forest he you know stumbled upon a stump like spoknulsa pinyok i on skazhe I was bewitched. That was a witchcraft, yeah? he, and somebody would say that the, the first sort of thing uh, to think is that you know this is stupid. This is natural. You just stumble. This is nobody's fault. It's it's a natural thing. Like you, it's your own fault. You didn't see this stump, and that's why you stumbled. Yeah, but to this, like the person who stumbled would say, but I know this forest, and I look around for the stumps right yeah i look under my feet when i walk so why so the fact that this happened to me today does not make any sense and i'm sure like you in your life also experience some sort of inexplicable unfortunate events like for instance it happened to me i was traveling to shimkent by car like from Astana to Shimkent and I remember I was passing this very dangerous road from starting from the southern tip of Balkhash Brulbaital and through Chu which is a very bumpy horrible road full of holes and I was even traveling like at the twilight and at night and I passed it well and I reached Shimkent and on the next day Tapatal Tsuche I kind of drive my car, drive like hit the curb, like just while turning on the road. So, and I think to myself, this does not make any sense. <laughs> you know, I pass through all the, you know, horrible bumps and horrible road, and I hit, and I, you know, and din gilegum tapatal stieshim kenti jarolda, janaka halayt sundrige bolat. Why is this happening? And some people said, "Did you write on the Facebook that you, you know, like passed safely through the dangerous roads of Shu?" They said, "Yes, I did." And somebody said, "Kustida." <laughs> so why, you know, you should pass through the dangerous roads of Shu and so on, and something should happen to you, you know, on the in the broad daylight? on a good road and so on. So these are kind of things that sometimes people, like we all run into and cannot explain. And we, as under, tend to blame somebody else who had bad wishes, right? And let's say sort of bad wish turn into like a substance or energy that, that could travel and cause this unfortunate event to happen. So it's not that they are not understanding the natural circumstances in which, let's say, the stumbling happened, right? The stumbling in the forest. No, of course I understand. Forest is a full of things. You can stumble, you can... But what they sort of presume is that there are not only one cause of things, right? There are sort of constellation of different causes. So of course it happened because of this stupid stump on the road, right? And of course it happened that, you know, maybe I was not paying good attention, but there was something else in the mix. Somebody's bad intention towards me that made it happen. So it's not that they are kind of not, they do understand the natural circumstances. And they do understand the causal sort of that there are, but they also understand that there can be many causes for something to happen and there can be a consolation. So as an example of how this works, how this logic works, I want to read uh, you a um, paragraph from Evans Pritchard. So the logic, like how people explain unfortunate events by witchcraft. So so-and-so was bewitched and killed himself, one would say. But he's telling you the ultimate cause of his death and not the secondary causes. You can ask him, how did he kill himself? And he will tell you that he committed suicide by hanging himself from the branch of a tree. Somebody hanged himself. You can also ask, why did he kill himself? 
And he will tell you that it was because he was angry with his brothers. The cause of his death was hanging from a tree and the cause of his hanging from a tree was his anger with his brothers. If you then ask Anazander why he should say that the man was bewitched if he committed suicide on account of his anger with his brothers, he will tell you that only crazy people commit suicide. And if everyone who was angry with his brothers committed suicide, there would soon be no people left in the world. And if this man had not bewitched, he would not have done what he did do. Also, witchcraft does not explain everything. For instance, you cannot like lie to somebody, you cannot commit an adultery, you cannot steal, you cannot and say, oh, I was bewitched. No, people would not buy it. So it explained like a, a certain kind of events, like certain kind of unfortunate, unfortunate events. And as he writes, it's sort of the constellation um, link between the space and time, right? It explains the coincidence and relationship between, like if for us it would be a coincidence that, that why this thing happened at that time in this place, for them would be, it would be that somebody have caused it. Like for instance, in our culture, like what is the most anecdotal? Like somebody walks and a brick falls on his head, right? Like kirpichu pal na golovu. Ну просто там неправильно лежал, и человек ходил там в неправильном месте, и на него упал кирпич, и это как бы, ну, не повезло, да? То есть как мы это объясним? Не повезло. Просто человеку не повезло. Он оказался at the wrong place, at the wrong time. Да? Но Азанда на нашем месте, они еще и подумают, а кто мог желать ему зла? Да? Кто мог желать этому человеку зла? И не, не потому, что этот человек пришел и сбросил кирпич, а просто это как бы дополнительная как бы коз, дополнительное это, что тоже привело к этому событию, несчастью. Да? И в принципе это... Uh, it makes sense in a way that, you know, we live, like, we live in a society, we live in a... Uh, there is a competition in society, there is jealousy, somebody is jealous of you, right? So like when we say, when Kustid, uh, right? We, like Zglazda, we imagine that somebody is jealous of you and he's not a well-wisher towards you and his, you know, energy of thinking bad towards you might have caused an unfortunate can cause an unfortunate event, right? And people, many people are really afraid of this kind of other people's bad wishes, right? And it also like opens up a conflict um, in society. Uh, like for instance, um, a conflict in which, you know, like amends are made in which people who are you know, were not well wishing towards the deceased person or the person who, you know, fell sick, would, you know, come to terms with their bad wishing. Uh, like, uh, remember in the documentary, there is a, uh, a family comes to an oracle, a husband and two wives, right? And uh, it, it is found that one of the wives bewitched another, right? And uh, and they sort of talk it out and she speaks and so on. And this is kind of like a family therapy, right? <laughs> of course, like it's, uh, uh, might be that this wife really, the second wife really did not wish well, well wish towards this first wife, right? Она не была как бы доброжелательной или не желала ей как бы всего хорошего. And this is, you know, brought out of you. And she said, you know, like, I'm sorry if I did not wish well towards you. I am trying, I will try to do like better in the future and so on and so forth. So this is kind of like a conflict in society is brought to an open, right? And then like people do it's kind of like instead of like in our funeral, people would come and say, you know, Iman the Bolson, Iman the Bolson, like, like, like if somebody died by, uh, 
um, through an unfortunate uh, sequence. So like, uh, let's say a brick fell on his head, the person died, we would come and say like, oh, what can we do? It's the will of God, yeah? Allah and Amr. Iman the wolf, Allah and Amr. Like, Adanda would come and say, you know, yeah, this person died, but let's find out who was jealous of him or who did not wish him well and let's talk to these people and let these people, you know, like uh, make a man, like redeem themselves, right, from for there. And this is kind of an interesting way <laughs> of dealing with the situation, right, as well. Um, so as uh, um, Evans Pritchard explained, this is not that uh, Azanda do not understand the natural uh, forces that uh, play part in these unfortunate events, like in the stumbling uh, while walking in the forest or, you know, grain, like a wooden post for um, grain hearts being eaten and falling and so on. It's just like that they think that there is also something else is the cause in addition to this natural causes. And one of the explanation is that, you know, people who are around, they're not always um, kind to each other, right? Sometimes they uh, hinder these bad intentions and that's why also the bad things are happening. And this is not, you know, completely illogical, right? Like that some people do not um, wish well to other people. Um, and this is how Evans Pritchard kind of explained how witchcraft makes sense when it's a uh, integral part of the belief system, when it's something that uh, occurs very often, and when it's particularly applied to explain these kind of unfortunate events. When there is seemingly nobody's fault, it's just an unfortunate constellation of different, you know, factors, but it might be as well that, you know, somebody's you know, bad thinking or bad substance and bad energy contributed to that. So this is uh, how Evans Pritchard explained the witchcraft. Now let's talk about Mary Douglas's book, Purity and Danger. And I think that the uh coronavirus and the whole pandemic situation sets uh, a new stage for me to teach the rules of this clean and unclean uh and pure and pure and uh, contagion and contamination and pollution how one can contract disease also ideas of mixing or prohibition of mixing with certain people or with certain species or eating certain things and uh, you know how nowadays because of the pandemics when somebody comes from abroad he has to go through the very strict regime of quarantine like he has to be cleansed <laughs> for like by sitting by himself for two weeks or so somewhere and then he comes out and he's kind of uh, clean to join the society so the um the book, Purity in Danger, it kind of uh, takes on a new meaning, I think, in the situation that we're experiencing. Um, and of course, it's, you know, nowadays we know that one can contract disease from domestic animals, right? Uh, like one, uh, brucellos, for instance, or anthrax, right? Sibirska uh, yazva can be contracted from animals. One can contract a disease from insects, like in the times of Evans Pritchard in Africa, there was a very widespread disease caused by a fly called tsetse, muha tsetse. It was called the sleeping disease, which would eat the, um, it would cause damage first to the animals, to the cows, and then 
to the people. And of course, people can contract disease from other people, as we know, uh, with coronavirus. Um, but the main idea of Mary Douglas's book is that any culture create categories of pure and unpure because it's in a human nature to try to create order out of house. And the sort of prevailing thought of the day was that the order that Europeans create was very rational, like the Europeans also have the rules of pure and unpure, like we have today, like against coronavirus, like who is considered contagious, who is considered, you know, contactly, who is considered clean and so on. And the rules, like the orders that primitive people have, like Azanda or some other people, like who have these taboos and so on, they kind of, they are not uh, rational and they don't create order. And uh, Mary Douglas, she walks uh, like her line of thought is against this uh, kind of argument that, you know, against this Europocentric argument that the rules that we have in our religion, like mon monotheistic religion, are rational and they create order while the rules uh, of other primitive religions are irrational and they don't like bring order and spirituality and so on and so forth. And she brings our attention to the uh, book that is uh, widely read in the Western world, and it's an um, old Bible, Vethizavet, particularly the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where with the rules of clean and unclean. And then will just let me play you um, some religious explanation that in some ways rationalizes, right, the rules of uh, Leviticus. Okay, do you see my YouTube? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh no, we cannot see it now. You cannot? No, there mm -hmm. are files. This no, makes... you don't see? Okay, just a moment. And now? Now we see it. ruins of a holy God for his holy people, we as followers of Yeshua abide by Yah's commandments. Since we love him, he having loved us first, creating us and redeeming us at the cost of his own son. Elohim's laws are just and holy. They contain blessings and protection for us and many spiritual truths. They are not subject to change. Why will they? In the law of the clean and unclean, for example, the Creator makes a distinction in the animal kingdom for us. Some animals are suitable for consumption, some are not. Take the pig, for instance. Here is a list of some things a swine will have been eaten 3,500 years ago. Garbage, other pigs, cadaver. Here is a list of things the pig will be eaten in our day. Garbage, other pigs, cadaver. It is still the same animal. This is not to mean that the pig is a creature from Sheol, a dark and a hell-bound being. It means that the creature was created to eat waste, to keep the earth clean. Eating it will be harmful to human health. However, briefly setting aside the sanitary issues, there are more profound qualities to be found as we look closer at the law of the clean and the unclean beasts. God, being spirit, teaches us spiritual things to things we can relate to. Yeshua did this a lot in his parables. We know of the master using the allegory 
of wine and wineskins to point out how a new teaching will not be accepted if an old doctrine is still profusely held on to. He used wine, that which we know and understand, to explain the possible consequences of bad teachings and how then to be receptive for new truths by renewing our mind through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaChodesh. With this in mind, let us look at attributes of the animals described in the third book of Moses. The mammals are classified into those that have a part of food and chew the cud. All the ones we may eat are those that have both chew the cud and have a part of food. As an example, we have the camel that chews the cud, but with no potted hoof being on clean force. Just as all those animals that have no potted hoof and do not chew the cud are clean. And of course, those that do have a potted hoof but do not chew the cud also being unclean. Chewing the cud means that the animal is a ruminant. Having a diverse digestive system, the beast chews its food a second time while lying down before final digesting it. It will usually eat fresh food. What if our Heavenly Father is encouraging us to reconsider what we've taken spiritually before it becomes a part of us and to only partake of clean, healthy teachings? As for the split hoof, the animal standing on all fours discerns every step of its way Every path it will take is rightly divided, not only separating the profane from the holy, but also distinguishing between teachings. Do you think this may be far-fetched? Well, why not think about it a second time before finally digesting while lying down and rightfully dividing? Thus, we are not to be brutish, devouring one another, completely void of the truth, nor shall we fail to discern we are not to take up every kind of garbage into our souls. Of the animals and the water, the only ones edible for us are the fish with scales and fins. One interesting attribute of this type of fish is its ability to swim against the current. Organisms like the eel or crab get sucked away when a strong current comes along, being basically defenseless, no armor. Do you see a need to be able to withstand the trials of life as a follower of Yeshua? Amongst the birds, all those that scavenge or prey on other birds are forbidden. Not only considering the health benefits of staying away from such food, we also notice that the birds we are allowed to eat are the peaceful ones. We do not fall over and kill each other. We are told by Yeshua to be as gentle as doves. We are allowed insects like the locusts and grasshopper, a creature that is able to mobilize to a formidable army. As a well-organized creature, there is order in the camp of Adonai. He is indeed raising a mighty army to fight spiritual battles. We are that army. The swarming things like vermin are also to be detestable to us. Likewise, all that creeps on its belly. A prime example will be the snake. A forked tongue spews venom, goes forth on its belly. Even if we do not notice these fascinating characteristics, merely Elohim saying, do not eat shall be enough for us. He is our father. So we noted that the mammals were classified into four categories. Divided hoof, choose the cut. No split hoof, choose the cut. Split hoof, choose no cut. Choose no cut, splits no hoof. Incidentally, we are mammals too. If we take these properties into new consideration on how to go about spiritual things, being of course the word, Yeshua's parable of the sower becomes even more enthralling. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. 
Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. So we have bad soil, bad fruit, bad soil, fruit turns bad, good soil, fruit turns bad, good soil, good fruit. And what does a seed represent? Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. So, are you still being shaken by every wind of doctrine that comes along, having no solid foundation in the Torah of God, maybe even claiming the law has been done away with? Or I have been discerning. I have been dividing the word of truth. Example of rationalization of the nations of Leviticus and, and I don't know which denomination it is, but it's sort of showing how the rules that are presented in the Holy Book of Old Bible in the book of Leviticus actually make sense rationally, right? Because they kind of prevent like both rationally and spiritually, right? Because the animals that are prescribed to eat they're kind of good uh, kind animals and the animals that are uh, abominable and uneatable they're kind of bad dirty bad looking you know snakes and like other uh, not so kind animals that eat garbage like a pig right and so on so and so it explains that there are different reasons right for behind these with taboos, which are essentially taboos, right? To eat certain food, a religious taboo. So if just just to emphasize, so there can be a clear religious explanation, right? Just God said so, and that's why <laughs> we are in a covenant with God, so that's why we have to follow the God's law. But there is also sort of rational explanation, right? That's, you know, it's maybe not advisable to eat vultures like that prey, that eat, you know, like that, the flesh of the dead. It might not be advisable to eat also, you know, um, other animals that also eat the flesh of the dead, right? So we are, what we usually eat, it's kind of, kind, ruminating, you know, like добрые, травоядные, парнокопытные животные, которые, как бы, it's kind of like you are what you eat, right? And he says that it's, it's, it's sort of safe to eat them, right? Unlike snakes, that, that's, it's not safe to eat. But of course, we know that people, you know, eat pork, that people eat snakes, and it's fine, right? So it's kind of, it's not a universal truth, but it's kind of, what they're trying to say is that um, these rules of clean and unclean, they created maybe a health structure for the time of the Levit when Leviticus was written, right? It's kind of like a Ministerstvo Zdravochranenia, которое выдает like протокол, что вы должны кушать, что съедобное, что несъедобное, что uh, как бы чистое, что опасно для жизни есть, и как нужно, как часто мыть, и так далее, и так далее. So the function of religion at the time. Uh, and so they're getting to the different functions of religion. As previously we talked about different functions of witchcraft for ordering people's life. Here we also have like talking about different functions of religion for ordering people's life and deciding what's clean and what's unclean and that people they cannot live without structures right even in our the most rational the most sort of irreligious society secular society they also have their own rules of clean and unclean which sometimes are not that far from the religious rules 
of clean and unclean. And the abomination that um, this short video was talking about, the it was Leviticus versus 11, 15, which explained like what kind of animals you can eat, what kind of birds you can eat, and what kind of fish you can eat, right? Please read this, uh, Leviticus. 11.15 and it's also uh, Leviticus uh, or Deuteronomy when there is a uh, prohibition of um, mixing or hybridization. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of clothes made of two kinds of material. And that man at the time like when this was written, that you should not wear the garment made of wool, like chest, with the garment made of linen, uh, lion. Yeah. And uh, even nowadays, like we don't have this prohibition, but oftentimes we have this aesthetical rule of not mixing, like шерстяную одежду с легкой летней одеждой, да, как будто бы это, но это не подходит, как будто бы. So this kind of the maybe it's a remnant of that. Uh, as um, ethical rule of uh, prohibiting, you know, hybridization that was uh, previously. So um, what I want you to get to this is sort of the functional. So what are the functions of religion, right? And what are the functions of um, various prohibitions that uh, and taboos that might seem um, irrational to us, mm -hmm. kind of like to try to see the whole picture. Um, and that, you know, there is some, as uh, there might be some rationality in them, apart from the religious reasoning. <clears throat> um, Okay, now it's time for Q&A.